Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, give a very sort of uh, biological talk. There will be some big data in there. That's what this meeting is very much about. And I'm not really going to talk about the, the algorithms or some of the ma machine learning approaches that uh, we and others in the field use. I'm going to talk a little more about the biology and, and um, hopefully get across why it's sort of how big data is having such an impact in medicine right now. So I'm going to tell you a story about a form of muscular dystrophy that we've been studying for about the last 15 years. Um, so muscular dystrophy actually is, a, is a, a name that covers a broad range of diseases. So it's a, the definition is it's progressive weakness or loss of muscle through gene mutations. And there's a whole host of different mutations that cause muscular dystrophy. Um, and if you're more interested in that, the Muscular Dystrophy Association has a great website that describes it, or uh, the National Institute of Health does as well. And then something that people frequently ask is, how common is, is muscular dystrophy in general? Well, overall, muscular dystrophy can affect you know, maybe upwards of 0.05% uh, of the population. But then if you're talking about a specific form of muscular dystrophy, which we will do today, you know, there's examples where it's just a single family in a country. Or you know, up to 0.1% of the population. And the, the disease we're going to talk about, myotonic dystrophy, um, is a little more common. So myotonic dystrophy, it's the most common form of adult onset muscular dystrophy. Actually, though, there are children that are born with it, and that's how a whole family, extended family, gets diagnosed with uh, this form of muscular dystrophy. It's autosomal dominant disorder, and what that means is it, it's in every generation. It can't skip a generation. If it skips a generation, then the, the mutation that's causing the disease is lost in that family, which is a good thing, obviously. Um, so we're still sort of trying to figure out the prevalence. Um, depending on whose papers you're reading, it's 1 in 8,000 or 1 in 20,000 individuals, so that's relatively common. There's actually a region outside of um, Toronto, near Quebec, where it's one in 500 because of a founder population. Um, so muscle weakness, the myotonia, actually, and I'll show you a video of that. If it transferred. Yeah, it did. Um, so this is sometimes how clinicians actually will diagnose patients, is they'll shake hands or they'll have them grip something. And what you can see here is that the individual now let's go, and you can see they almost have to shake it out. So the muscles contract and they don't release. You can see it's now just now releasing. Um, and I know individuals with myotonic dystrophy who, when something's cold, it actually makes it worse, and the muscles contract and they literally can't let go of something. Um, so that's the myotonia, and we actually know down to the, to the, to the gene what causes the myotonia. Uh, heart dysfunction is a real issue for these, these folks. Um, something that you'll see sometimes with more senior folks is iridescent cataracts, a really unusual uh, form of that. A lot of GI issues we hear from the patients and the families. Cognitive issues is really big. So this, this is not just a muscle, skeletal muscle disease. It affects cognition, sleep, deficiencies is a big thing. Um, some clinicians claim this is maybe one of the more complex diseases, and I hopefully will uh, you'll understand in the big data why this is so complex. Okay. The other thing that's sort of fascinating in terms of medical terms is there's something called genetic anticipation in myotonic dystrophy. Um, so this is three generations, and what you can see in, in, this, in the, the picture of the young boy is that he has a fairly severe form. His muscles in his face actually sort of are loose. They, um, you know, he, he has that open mouth form, and his muscles just you know, aren't, aren't well formed. The mother on the right, uh, she has some symptoms, and then the grandmother has very mild symptoms. And so what tends to happen in these families, it gets progressively worse, and that has to do with the mutation changing over time um, through the generations. And I'll explain that. Okay. So I'm sure maybe not a lot of you have thought about the central dogma recently, so we'll do a little quick review. So obviously DNA is essential, it's the blueprint. So what we do with the DNA, or what the cells do with the DNA, is it makes a transient copy called RNA or mRNA. And then that mRNA codes for a protein. So that's sort of the central dogma, essential sort of uh, mechanism for biology. Um, and then what, in myotonic dystrophy, so, and actually that, oh, this didn't show up quite as well as I'd hoped, but in, in, in bacteria or simple cells, it is a simple sort of one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. There's a, a piece in the DNA that codes for the RNA and codes for a protein. But actually, in humans and in most mammals, 
you make a copy of the DNA called the pre-mRNA, so that RNA transcribed directly off the genome is called pre-mRNA, and that pre-mRNA is processed, and what you can sort of see here is, I'll have another picture on the next slide that's a little better, is there's little regions within the pre-mRNA that you have to splice out and paste those together, and pasting those pieces together is what actually codes for the protein. But what that means is you can paste those in different orders. You could skip, say, the red box or the blue box, and you'll make slightly different protein variants. And actually, what we've realized with deep sequencing, where we can sequence the genome and sequence the transcriptome, all the RNA, is that about 95% of all of our genes are alternatively spliced. So one of the big surprises of the human genome when it was published in 2003 was that there was only maybe 20 to 25,000 genes, which doesn't, I mean, sounds like a lot, but it's really not that many. But now what we've realized is that 20 to 25,000 genes can be turned into hundreds of thousands of RNAs and hundreds of thousands of proteins. So there's really sort of a much deeper le level of biology there. Um, something that I've studied for the last 20 years is uh, a machine called the spliceosome. So it's a small molecular machine made up of more than 200 components that actually recognizes, it's sort of reading that RNA, and then it splices out the, the thin lines and pastes together the, the larger lines, and that spliceosome is sort of critical for doing things properly in the cell. And we'll talk about one small component of it in this disease. So, um, so one of the things, at least I feel like we're doing a fairly good job in, in the molecular biology field is publishing all of our data. So one of the really powerful um, platforms out there is the genome browsers. And this is just one example from the University of California Santa Cruz genome browser where you can literally, you know, all the sequencing data is being uh, uploaded and you can go and look at it. And this is just an example of looking at a particular gene. This is actually a gene for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, so the one that causes the, the disease uh, for the little boys in the wheelchairs. And I, I just want, what I want you to take away from this um, is that the exons are tiny. So the exons are the thin little lines, so this is the scale, and the introns are the long lines. And so the spliceosome has to find these tiny little exons in a sea of RNA and splice them together. And if you don't splice them together just in the right way, you don't make the right proteins and you have all sorts of issues. So that is, is sort of a critical thing. And so what we've realized over the last sort of 20 years is the disruption of that splicing, not pasting them together, leads to about 15 or up to 50% of human diseases are associated with splicing regulation. Um, so one of the ones that's quite common is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, and then another form is spinal muscular atrophy. We're realizing in cancer, in almost every type of cancer, you can find sort of splicing mutations. We don't know if the splicing mutations always cause the cancer or if they're sort of secondary. And now a lot of people are studying autism because it looks like the missplicing is, is really playing a role in, in autism as well. And just to sort of make hopefully help this sort of make sense to you um, from Quantum Magazine. Uh, you know, you, you're, you're pasting these things together and you want to paste them in, in the right way, pasting the letters together, and you get a healthy uh, individual. And if you don't paste them together, you get a diseased individual. And, it, and at times, it's, it's really that simple. You can have a single gene that le leads to spinal muscular atrophy or Duchenne's muscular dystrophy because you don't get the splicing working correctly. Um, but the disease I'm going to tell you about, myotonic dystrophy, and actually Huntington's disease, ALS, in 2011, the most common mutation in, uh, in ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, is caused by these simple repeats. So our genome is made up of a lot of letters, three billion letters, right? And so genome sequencing has allowed us to read that code. Um, and what we've realized, and we can't always read this part of the code, sometimes we have to use other approaches, is that there's expansions in our genome. And these expansions are causing lots of different diseases now over about 30 different types. And the two I'm going to talk about are DM1 for myotonic dystrophy or dystrophia myotonia type 1 and type 2. They're actually two different mutations, two different chromosomes. So they're in two different genes. So you'd think, oh, you're affecting different genes. It shouldn't be the same disease. But it's actually the same disease because... It's actually not in the coding instructions. It's in, some, in the RNA, and it's in the RNA that usually you just get rid of it. We think of as the junk, but that junk actually has, basically acts like a toxic sponge. And so when you have hundreds or thousands of these repeats, um, it's a problem, and it's a problem in lots of diseases, but we're just gonna talk about DM uh, today, myotonic dystrophy.
Um, and something that I don't think people always appreciate is that your genome actually changes uh, each time you replicate that DNA. You know, hopefully it's very few mutations because those mutations can lead to cancer and other diseases. But what we realized in myotonic dystrophy is that, you know, this is just over two years uh, in patient A and patient B, and you can see in this region of the genome where the repeats are, we're just looking at the CTG repeats, the, the mutation for type 1, you can see there's a lot of variation. The, the, the repeats are changing by literally 50 or hundreds of nucleotides in just this two-year period. And actually, so patients will have, from their blood, will measure their repeat length, and they may have, say, 200 repeats, and, you know, that can be a problem, but then sometimes after death or, or at other times through other techniques, we'll measure the repeat length and it'll actually have changed to 2,000 repeats. So your genome is, is in a sense fairly plastic and changing. So depending on the tissue, uh, it changes. And so that's at the DNA level. But then if you think back to that central dogma, we're making copies of the DNA and making cop and it turns into RNA. And actually for this disease, it's the RNA that's the problem. If you actually just if it wasn't turned on and turned into RNA, it wouldn't cause a problem because we've shown that in, in um, models systems. So it's the RNA level, the CUG or the CCUG repeat, and that varies across patients and tissues. And that's why we think it um, has different severities. And then also that anticipation, what tends to happen is that each generation, the repeats get longer and longer, and so the onset of the disease gets earlier and earlier. So even where children will be born right away with a severe form and they're on respiratory um, respirators and things like that. Okay. So how does this disease work at the mo molecular level? So we can visualize this in patient cells and in other things is that literally, oh, maybe I have a pointer. Oh, well. Um, well, I'll just use this as the pointer. So these, um, under the microscope, we can see what, what are foci. And these long repeats are transcribed into RNA, and what that acts like is a sponge and soaks up, I have a little sponge to hopefully make the point, is that they, they soak up all these RNA binding proteins, and that's the little green dumbbells. And the, the name of the protein is muscle blind. It was actually discovered in 1997. And, it, and um, it was discovered in fruit flies. A group was studying them, and they got mutations. And interestingly, this protein, when they had mutations in this protein in the flies, the flies had muscle issues and eye issues. So the name of the gene became muscle blind. And sort of amazingly, when we discovered many years later that this was the gene, uh, the protein that was soaked up by the toxic sponge, these individuals have muscle issues, eye issues. So it sort of shows you the power of studying things in, muscle, in model systems. Um, so what literally happens is you get these sponges forming, the protein gets sequestered um, in the in, with the repeats, you can visualize it in cells, and depending on the cell type, you have more of these foci or less. And what muscle blind should be doing is not soaked up in these sponges, but it should be regulating splicing. And so what muscle blind should be doing is interacting with the pre-mRNA as it's being made, and sending signals to the splicing machinery to include, for example, the red exon in, muscles, in muscle cells or the blue exon, say, in the CNS. And so muscle blind's a master regulator of splicing. And so when muscle blind sequestered away, all the misplicing, or there's splicing that should occur in, in sort of the right way to regulate development and regulate other processes is messed up. And so there's literally hundreds or thousands of changes that are happening in the, in the RNA level that are then translated to the proteins. And so now to the big data part, what we can do, and this um, Illumina and others sort of really power, uh, sort of set this up for us and others in the field, is that we can purify the transcriptome. So we, we actually, we know the DNA most usually, but what we want to understand is what's happening at that next level, all the RNA that's more of a transient. So we, collect all the RNA from cells or tissues. We frequently will get muscle biopsies from these individuals and from healthy controls. That's very important to compare healthy and disease state. And then we purify all that RNA. So literally, you know, millions of molecules. Um, we turn it into DNA. So we, synth we can, um, with enzymes that we've purified, we can turn that RNA into DNA. And then using a, uh, a Lumina HiSeq platform, 
we sequence all that DNA. So we, li we get millions of reads. Um, you can get you know, now actually 500 billion reads a week. It's sort of amazing how much data we're generating. And that's why computer scientists are now so important in biology is because we need to be able to um, handle the data, manipulate the data. Uh, one of the things that we have to do is align all that data back to the, to the genome to know where that RNA is being made. So we use programs to align um, the short reads because they're actually just about 100 base pairs long. And we have to figure out where they sit in the genome. So that's an alignment process. Um, and then when we know that, we can start thinking back to the biology. Um, oh, and just to, for those that are interested, it's, it's really sort of cool technology how this works. You're literally looking at clusters of DNA um, using fluorescence, and each base has a different fluorescent tag. So you can watch um, uh, on, under the, basically under the microscope as the tags are added. And as I said, you can get 500 bi billion base pairs each week. So it's a real big data problem. Um, so, you know, it's important now that we have access to the um, uh, supercomputing resources and things like that for analyzing all this data and storing the data. Um, so what we did in collaboration with uh, ver various clinicians, one uh, good colleague, Charles Thornton at Rochester, has collected lots of tibialis anterior um, samples. So it goes in and takes just a small muscle biopsy. So literally, you know, a few micrograms of, t of muscle. And then we turn that into RNA. And then we sequence it. And then using um, a pipeline of programs, we can look at the RNA after aligning it. And something called a program we refer to as MISO, or as mixture of isoforms. We can look at how splicing is um, changing in the patient sample. And so here, um, you can see that there's a difference between the two um, isoforms. So that's that exon that, for example, in the, in the healthy individual is included, but in the DM individual, it's excluded. And so that changes the protein readout. And so what we've realized is that there's many of these changes happening through sequencing. In this case, we've just done 44, or not just, but 44 uh, individuals with myotonic dystrophy in the same muscle sample, and then we've done healthy control individuals, and we compare all that data um, to understand the changes. And so just to, to give you a, a flavor of what's happening is we have, you know, over 400 or 445 exons that are changing. So, you know, in, in many genes, we have many changes. So you can imagine some of those changes may not matter. But actually, many of them do matter. And so that video I showed you early on, the myotonia, we've tracked back to an individual gene called the chloride channel that's important for how chloride ions um, are in flux across your, your membranes in, in the muscle cells. And what happens is the misplicing in that chloride channel means now the chloride channel protein's not made properly, and now you can't regulate the flow of ions, and that causes the myotonia. Because actually we've shown in a mouse model, if you rescue just that one misplicing event out of these 445, you rescue the myotonia in, that in, in the mouse model. We assume that translates to the humans, but you don't do those experiments in humans, obviously. Um, so then we have you know, retained introns. That's where instead of splicing out all the uh, introns, you are leaving introns in. And then there's changes in splice usages. So where you're not just skipping whole exons, but you're changing where you're reading the, the, the splicing. And then the other challenge is you're changing up to 3,000 transcripts. So you make the transcript, but you've changed the level of it. Now if you change the level, you're not making enough protein, or you're making too much protein. So you're changing the balances of all the proteins. So literally, there's you know, thousands of changes going on in these cells. And so trying to track what's happening in the cells and with the patient's symptoms is really important. And so those are things a lot of us in the field think a lot about. So that's why this um, deep sequencing or next generation sequencing in genomics has been so powerful for us in the field. And what I'll, I'll show you is that when you start diving into the data, it gets even more interesting. Um, so this is a, a heat map where each box represents a, an, a splicing event for a particular gene. So on the, on the left there are genes. There's about 46 different genes. And then um, across the, the top, 
is the individuals from our, you know, the 44 patients. And then we actually have something called ProtoDM, where we've identified individuals who have mutations, but they really show no symptoms. But we know they have basically the mutation that's almost myotonic dystrophy. And then we have the, the, the control individuals that don't have the mutation. So they have, you know, very few repeats, like probably most of us have very short repeats in, the, in these regions in the genome while the proto-mutations have maybe 50 to 75, and then the DM1, hundreds or thousands of repeats. But what hopefully you can see here is that as you go across, the different splicing events, you know, have different, if you, something called the, the psi value. So the psi value is how we measure precisely the splicing. So if it's 1.0, that means that that exon's included 100% of the time. If it's down at 0.1, that means only 10% of the time is that exon included. And you can see we've been able to, to measure that in all these individual cases. And you can see that different exons are sort of misspliced at different levels. So down at the bottom, you can see in almost every individual with the disease that um, CLK4 or the other one that I can't quite read, you know, every mutation is there. We do have a few white boxes that means we didn't get enough data to, to make that measurement. So that we can always go back and sequence even more data or sequence just in that region to get that data if we feel like it's really important. Um, but then if you go up to the top, you can see that actually like that APT, ATP2A1 is that there's a, there's a spectrum. So some individuals that have the disease actually don't have missplicing in that gene. And what we think's happening there is that they have different lengths of repeats, and so they have sort of different sizes of toxic sponges. And so for that ATP2A1, you need a large toxic sponge to cause the misplicing. So only the individuals on the far left sort of have the misplicing because they have large toxic sponges, while the ones in the middle have smaller toxic sponges, and so you have enough of that protein to still do its job. So what that's telling us is that different splicing events sort of require different amounts of protein. And that gets back to sort of the first principles of biology that, you know, the, how things are regulated is concentration dependent. Something I'm not gonna get into is that the slope, which is the blue boxes, um, is something we've realized tells us how quickly some, or how the concentration range of these events. And some seem to, to change almost like a, like a light switch, while others are more like a rheostat and change over a broad concentration range. And just, just to, to tell you that we have lots more data, so from Charles, Tom, and others uh, at Stanford, John Day, David Brook in the UK, we've collected now, um, actually this is outdated, we now have a couple of brain samples as well from autopsy patients. Um, we have heart, by the heart again from autopsy, and we have lots of other muscles, because in different muscles, the individuals are affected differently. So depending on the sort of the repeat load, they have different effects, and so we want to understand that by studying the different muscles. And so we're collecting data from the different muscles. Um, and at this point, we have over 160 samples in total. I think now we're at more like 180, um, probably more like you know 55 billion reads. And so it's really important for us to be able to, to manage this data on the uh, on the supercomputer on the Hypergator system at uh, UF um, and start analyzing all this data. And so it's uh, it's. We're, we're lucky to have a strong computer science group helping us analyze all this data. So, so why, is, why is this important? Oh, and something we, we and others in the field feel strongly about is making this data um, available to the public. So we, um, this was actually started at MIT with my colleague Eric Wang and Chris Burge. Um, we've started uh, a deep sequencing data repository. And so this is for anyone who's interested in understanding this disease, we make all the data available so they can mine the data, and we have some tools um, on this website for mining the data to see how it changes across patients, across different genes, and things like that. Um, so the implications for this, though, is, is thinking about clinical trials. Because, you know, one of the things is, you know, you can measure, you know, obviously you want to you wanna measure muscle strength and things like that, but, you know, when you're, um, designing drugs and thinking about uh, therapeutics, you want to have also molecular readouts so that you can collect very small muscle biopsy samples, and then you can basically sample the, the sequencing to see how your drugs are working. So that's something that um, we and others are doing. And so this RNA-seq analysis 
uh, tells us that maybe not all splicing events make good biomarkers. So what we've realized is that certain biomarkers, so the ones in the gray at the top, change, um, you know, they change, as you can see in the curve, when the disease severity is relatively mild. So you may want to str um, stratify your patient population for biomarkers, is what we're learning, is that you know, certain biomarkers are good if the patient has a relatively mild form of the disease. If they have a more moderate form, you know, these splicing biomarkers in the middle, they're changing um, in that concentration regime, and you can see that you get a nice change so that you can get a good readout that your drug is working or not working, right? You want to know if that's happening. And then for the severe, um, when the disease is severe, you can see that there's other splicing biomarkers that we want to use. And so, because you could imagine that, you know, at that ATP2A1, if you're trying to use that as a biomarker for say the moderate or mild, it's actually not going to change because it, it's not being changed in the disease state. So understanding how these splicing events are changing is really important in terms of having molecular biomarkers. So we're working with the FDA to get approval for these as a panel of molecular biomarkers and also for thinking about how we stratify the patients for clinical trials and things like that. Okay. So I just... Hopefully, I've, I've convinced you, um, uh, this broad audience, that genomics, or it's really transcriptomics that we're doing. So the transcriptome, what's being transcribed, is actually what we're sequencing. Um, it all builds, of course, on the DNA, on the genomic sequence, is providing a better understanding of the mechanisms underlying myotonic dystrophy. I didn't really dive into this, but we were starting to realize that a lot of the missplicing were now, as I told you, the one story ties to the myotonia, but now we're looking for the ones that tie to the CNS or the sleep, the ones that uh, tie to the heart dysfunction, general muscle weakness. It seems like there it's, it's a little more complicated. There's many splicing events that we can tie to those symptoms. Um, as I just told you, the biomarkers for clinical trials we feel are really important. Um, obviously, that would be paired with, say, the six-minute walk test for, for the individuals to see if we're improving their ability to walk quicker, uh, other muscle measurements. Um, and then, you know, for cancer, I think probably you, maybe you've heard talks about personal medicine. Well, that's happening also in the muscular dystrophy field. We're doing it for myotonic dystrophy. We're doing it for other um, diseases such as ALS and spinocerebellar ataxias. And then I guess the one thing that sort of is, in a way, fascinating is how the splicing changes across all these tissues. So if I just told you about the, the TA, so that's in one specific muscle, but actually now that we're starting to look in the brain or in the heart, it's actually a different set of splicing biomarkers. So you have to know what biomarkers to look at and what tissue. So sort of understanding that and genomics allows us to do that and looking at all this data. And then, of course, what we're, under, what we're learning here, of course, ties back to understanding human development. And I think one of the things that, when I first started in this field maybe 20 years ago, it wasn't clear to us how important splicing was. And now it's clear to us splicing is really important in human development. And it's a way to take your genome and, and change that blueprint so that it can do lots of different things. Um, okay, so I'll just acknowledge um, all the work, uh, actually all this work started at the University of Oregon where I started my uh, research group in 2002. So Adam Strzok, uh, more of a computational biologist student who's now at the Oregon Health Sciences University, really started m analyzing all the deep sequencing data. It was in collaboration with Eric Wang and Chris Burge at MIT when Eric was a graduate student. Now Eric's a, a new faculty member at UF where we're building a center for neurogenetics. There's now about 40 of us. So this is just my group on the right at UF. Um, who's studying myotonic dystrophy. Um, and then there's a whole host of other um, students and postdoctoral fellows who con contributed to this work. And then, of course, the funding from the National Institute of Health, the Muscular Dystrophy Association, the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, and, and other foundations. And thank you for your time. <laughs>